Well, ladies and gents, uh, I'd like to welcome you to um, our event today, Wellbeing for We Ones, uh, which is sponsored by uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, my name is Jeremy Smith, and um, uh, I'm a fellow of the Society, um, and uh, I've been asked to chair uh, the event today, uh, since I have the honour of being the Young People's Programme Convener for the Society, um, which is something which is very dear to my heart. Um, We've got an exciting event today. Um, we have four speak, uh, three speakers, uh, uh, and um, the event is going to be dealing with questions of children and young people's mental health, uh, very much part of the story uh, uh, in recent months because of the COVID, of course, but um, underpinning it other things. We're going to bring together some experts with perspectives from art therapy, um, psychology, uh, and psychiatry. They're going to be discussing questions like what are the features of early relationships that support babies' well-being? How do babies develop secure attachments? And what support may we need to offer uh, when relationships are having difficulties? Um, so these are very much um, issues uh, current uh, in debate about mental health, and especially with, with, with small children. So uh, that's essentially what we're going to do. And it fits very much with the remit of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which um, according to our strap line is knowledge made useful. Um, we're always keen to leverage um, research and thinking uh, into addressing some of the bigger questions that society has faced, faces, especially those uh, relevant to, to Scotland. Um, okay, right, well, what I'm going to do next is rather a pleasant thing um, because I'm going to introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Vicky Armstrong, uh, whose uh, avatar appears rather attractively uh, 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 on the screen. She's doing what looks like a yoga pose, Vicky. So, so I think, uh, Vicky, you could turn on your uh, image now uh, and unmute yourself uh, uh, because we have something of, of a special moment for uh, uh, Vicky Gus, her presentation. Um, uh, Vicky, apart from being uh, an art therapist and uh, a postgraduate researcher in psychology from East Dundee, um, she's also uh, uh, the recipient of something rather grand and special, uh, which is um, uh, a medal from the Royal Society of Edinburgh uh, for her public engagement, which is um, uh, exciting stuff. And I'm, I'm going to embarrass Vicky uh, by asking her now to hold up this medal. Uh, there it is, <laughs> see? Uh, uh, there we go. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great pleasure and a great honour to have you as our first speaker. Uh, and as I said to Vicky earlier on, I think it's quite important you should leave it casually about so that when visitors like come from, they, yes, there you go. <laughs> that's, what, that's what mantelpieces are all about. Um, so uh, that's for you. Anyway, I'm going to shut up talking. Now, each of the speakers are going to talk for about 10 minutes about their, um, uh, uh, their agenda. Uh, and at the end of it, we'll have the Q&A discussion. We should have about 20 minutes or so for Q&A. Um, so I hope we'll be able to, uh, uh, to, to get some interesting discussion going. I understand there's a lot of people um, uh, uh, in this, in this uh, virtual room. Uh, uh, of course, you know, we can't see you, but we, we know you're there lurking. Uh, so um, uh, I, if I miss your question, uh, um, please don't feel hurt. We're going to be racing down as much as we can, but I will try and, and make sure that everybody gets their fair shake of, of things that are interesting to say. Anyway, I'm going to shut up now. And Vicky, I believe the, t the screen is yours. I'm going to turn myself off and go mute. Uh, oh, no, it's not, is it? It's going to be Rachel. I'm going to pass to Rachel. Rachel to start. I'm sorry, you see, I was sticking to my old script. What a terrible thing to do. Uh, so I'm going to turn to Rachel, who is going to introduce herself. Then we'll come back to Vicky uh, while she preens herself uh, with her medal, uh, which I think is quite an important thing to do. Thank you, Vicky. And I'm going to shut up. Rachel, would you like to introduce yourself and make your, just don't make your piece? Uh, I want to start while I'm just doing this, getting the slideshow going. Hopefully you can see that now. By thanking Vicky. Well, thanking the RSE also, but really thanking Vicky because um, if it weren't for you being so generous as to share your platform after winning your prize, then we wouldn't be here. Anne and I wouldn't have been invited and we wouldn't have the opportunity to speak to what's a completely bewildering <laughs> number of people. So I'm really pleased that you're all here. 
And I have a very short uh, space of time we all do today to talk to you about something really important and it's impossible to do it justice in, in such a tiny space of time. So it's um, my task to give you a sort of introduction to what we mean when we're talking about wellbeing for wee ones, which in clinical terms we call infant mental health. Um, just to give you a bit of an introduction really to that, I am a perinatal psychologist by training, which means I work with families through from the entire perinatal period from conception through to around three. Um, and for the past couple of years, I've been lucky enough to be working with the Parent Infant Foundation, which is a UK wide charity which uh, helps the development of specialist parent infant mental health teams, um, relationship teams. But I am moving between that and a post in perinatal services with NHS Lothian. So forgive me if I get my we and they a little bit mixed up in this presentation. When we're talking about well-being for wee ones, which is a huge topic, I just want to rest a little on what it is we're actually talking about. We are talking about environmental provisions, which, you know, having something in the tummy, being warm enough, um, having a clean nappy, perhaps. But we're talking about something really quite far beyond that into the emotional health of little ones, because what we know now is that later well-being in all areas of life is contingent on a really good start emotionally. So yes, absolutely, uh, environmental provisions, but something beyond that also. And with an acknowledgement to the Zero to Three website, which is one of the websites that I flagged in, in the resources, um, they've divided emotional well-being into three quite neat um, sort of blocks. And they are you know, the opportunity and the capacity to develop good, secure, warm, trusting relationships for little ones to experience and to be able to express safely a full range of emotions and to feel safe enough and motivated enough to explore and to play and to learn, which is obviously something that, that is Vicky's specialism. And I hope she'll say a bit more about all of that for tiny ones happens within relationships. There's psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott was very famous for saying there's no such thing as an infant. And what he was getting at when he said that was that an infant can't survive on its own. And that's something that it, it's sort of logical to us in physical terms. Babies can't talk to us and babies are dependent on us for survival, but their brains are dependent on us too. So babies' brains need brains and from others and are their bodies need bodies from others too. And that happens within the family context, the cultural context and the community context. So that's where we start. Babies' brains are such a mystery because they can't talk to us. And so the question arises, what is happening in there? And they do have ways of telling us, but it's not in words. Well, for a start, dizzyingly, I think, more than a million neural connections are starting per second on average in the first couple of years of life, which is just extraordinary, particularly for those of us who are old enough for that very definitely not to be happening anymore. And we know that brains are built from the bottom up. So we come pre-programmed with some existing structures and they are to basically regulate in very basic terms, to breathe, to suck, to swallow, to cry. And beyond that, not a huge amount. Um, and even our genetic makeup, we now understand a bit more about how dependent um, our environments and our relationships are in facilitating the, the development of our own characteristics, our own sense of selves, as well as our physical and cognitive capacities. So everything is built on these basic building blocks. Um, the, stru the in initial structures which come are built and built on and built on and built on. So those first two years of life, are the foundations really for everything that comes afterwards, which I think for many of us as parents is quite a sort of daunting idea that there's that it, everything is so open to influence and, and it is daunting in a way. We do have responsibility, but the happy flip side of that is that babies' brains are incredibly plastic and they learn and they relearn and the possibility for repair is huge when babies are little. So it's not, you're, you're not to be too worried about that. Those blocks, depend upon relationships of safety and relationships which are warm, consistent, and where there's enough safety for them to be playful as well. I suppose what I really want to put across is that everything which comes after 
it relies upon the quality of relationship in those in those first couple of years. Why does it matter? Well, if we're a compassionate society, and I think we hope that we are, then people having the foundations in which they can become fulfilled and happy, content individuals is, is important. It's an important thing morally and in and of itself. It's also important socially because we know that many of the necessary, although not sufficient, lots of variables going on, many of the necessary precursors to difficulties later on in, in childhood and adulthood, that their origin is in these key developmental periods in infancy. And that's, you know, events, um, things like mental health problems for sure, but also maybe some which are a bit less clearly related as you might think, like um, physical health pathology, cardiovascular disease, that sort of thing. So it's it's really important. It's not just important for a sense of well-being, but for for physical health as well. Um, and it's economically important, which is something that's perhaps less comfortable for some of us who work in the NHS or public servants or work in the third sector. We like to think about that a bit less. But there's been loads of work now, um, which demonstrates that. If you invest as a society in the human capital, if you like, um, in, in the early years, you get far more return than you do in investing further upstream later on. And that's also, you know, it's, it's important because if you invest in the early years, then you're talking about perhaps less of a burden and some of those services that are so horribly burdened at the moment, like CAMS, child, child and adolescent mental health services. So there's something really important in all those aspects, morally, socially, and economically about investment in the early years. Many of you will have heard of, about adverse childhood experiences. There's a lot of lot going on to try to prevent that in Scotland and to try really hard to think about what we do as a society about adverse childhood experiences. And it's very closely related to what we're talking about here. It's not all though, it's more complex than that because in infant mental health, we're not just talking about the absence of adversity, we're talking about the presence of positive um, and particular relational qualities and attributes um, in order that babies can thrive and grow into thriving children and then thriving adults. I'm going to give you some examples of those building blocks that we want to see in early relationships, which we know relate to better function and to um, contentment and good brain development and development of the self socially, cognitively. I wish there was a holistically might be the way of putting it. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them because of time, but to, to kind of chunk them, we're talking about three things largely. We're talking about parents and caregivers having the capacity to think of their babies, to reflect upon the fact that their babies are people in their own right with needs and with thoughts and with wishes and with preferences, um, different from them, but connected, of course. Um, and reflective capacity, you know, that ability to really conceive of your baby as, as a person um, with a mind is um, really important. And then when you move through things, you get attunement and sensitivity and repair, which is about having the capacity to guess and to work out what your baby's communicating to you, doing that accurately, and crucially, not doing it perfectly. We know that it's imperfect in good enough parenting about 70% of the time, something like that. So it's certainly not about being perfectly attuned to your baby. That can be perceived as intrusive, if anything, by your baby. But what's important is the capacity to repair that, to notice and to be okay with that, and to repair that, and to tolerate the fact that most of us have quite mixed feelings often, especially under stress towards our babies. And um, there's a vast majority of mums uh, in the postnatal period who have very difficult thoughts and feelings towards their babies in the context of sleeplessness and all the massive change and stress that happens. Um, but the ability to tolerate that and to integrate that is really important. And then lastly, these last three, and that's what um, I hope Vicky is going to beautifully um, illustrate with um, art at the start is scaffolding and the creation of structure and safety for babies not so that it restricts them but so they know what to predict and so they feel safe enough and parents feel safe enough 
for babies and little people to explore and to play and to express themselves and to start to foster a sense of independence. So these are some of the things. I'm sure there's plenty of clinicians who are, <laughs> who are watching this webinar and thinking, oh, you forgot this or that. I know what I forgot, but it's very hard to get it all in there. These are some of the important ones. But when we think about that, those of you who are not working specifically with in infant mental health or with very, very young children, I want to mention what that means that families need. If this is what we want to create, the conditions where this can happen, what do families need in order for that to happen? Well, they need social and financial safety and good health. It's very hard to be parentally preoccupied if you don't know if you have enough money for your electricity meter or if you're malnourished yourself because you have to make the choice between feeding yourself and feeding your baby. These are really important setting conditions, if you like, to create parents and caregivers who are able to look after their babies in the way that in the right circumstances, of course, they can. People need a sense of connection to their community. Um, tricky at the moment, tricky at the best of times, certainly tricky at the moment. And then they need services which are sufficient which are reflective and timely. They need those from the universal services. So that's things like um, health visiting. And when things are difficult and there is relational strain and there is the dark stuff and the difficult stuff and trauma, people need access to timely containing, accessible, let's put the list, non-stigmatizing specialist services. And that's what Anne is going to come to in her presentation to just talk a little to what loads of us from different sectors have been trying to help establish in Scotland in the last couple of years that there are people from lots of professional backgrounds who use lots of different theories to do lots of different types and levels of interventions with families which are non-stigmatizing and which are non-judgmental and which help to foster some of the conditions which make these things here a possibility. So when we talk about well-being for wee ones, in part, we are talking about ACEs, adverse, adverse childhood experiences. Um, and we're talking about it being incumbent on all of us, whether we work in infant mental health or not, or in early years or not, to work towards reducing stress, reducing poverty and structural inequality, creating a sense of safety for people, by which I mean people who are facing issues like domestic violence or for any minoritized or marginalized community who feel excluded and where there are barriers um, to access healthcare. So the message is that there isn't any such thing as a baby. There is only a baby and a caregiver and the care that they get in those first couple of years of life shapes everything that comes later. But in order for that to be good enough, we have to look after the people who are looking after as well as the interventions for the baby and for the baby and the, and the caregiver. It's, it's complex stuff. And I make no apology for not rendering it less complex. Um, there's so much good information out there for people. Here are some of the websites that you can look at. UNICEF and the Parent Club Scotland has got great information for parents. Um, Zero to Three Parent Infant Foundation, AIM UK, which is the Association of Infant Mental Health, and the First Thousand and One Days Movement. Loads of information for campaigning and for all sorts of different services and clinicians and the Anna Freud Centre also for, for training. I hope you fall down a rabbit hole for this stuff because it's ever so important. And we will always welcome contact from people who would like to be involved or ask questions. And my contact details you'll be sent along with to staff at the Parent Infant Foundation, Karen, who runs the development side of things, and Sally, who is the head of policy and looks after the First Thousand and One Days movement, whose entire being is predicated and aims to campaign on the importance of emotional well-being in the very early years from conception through to two. I'm so grateful um, that you've listened and put up with such a whistle-stop tour and that's really whetted the appetite. Um, I'm grateful to the, the organisations whose um, information I have used. And I'm grateful to my two little friends, Aru and Sunny, and their grown-ups for, for letting me use their images in which they're deeply content because their looker, looker after grown-ups have, um, have enough support. And that's what it's all about. And um, there are some, that's Sunny there, there are some uh, 
uh, resources that I've used for this talk, which are in this section here. And um, yeah, welcome contact from any of you. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. And I'm going to hand over the baton directly. Thank you, Jeremy, sorry. I, I thought I was going to get a time prompt, but I haven't seen anything, but I've probably just gone horrifically over. Oh, I can't see anything. It's not popping up on my screen as my defense. I'm going to hand over to Vicky, who's the reason that we're here and who's going to tell you about the most gorgeous project, Art of the Start, which is um, fostering wonderful relationships through art and in families in Dundee. So over to you, Vicky. Thank you so much, Rachel. Just bear with me for one second while I work out how to share my screen. Here we go. There you go, hopefully that is working for everybody. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. So um, I'm gonna look at a specific example of how we might support wee ones and their families in the context of our project, Art at the Start. So myself and Josephine Ross, who's a developmental psychologist, have been collaborating with Dundee Contemporary Arts, which is a really lovely art space in the centre of Dundee. And we're looking at how helping very young children to make art together with the important grown-ups in their lives can strengthen their relationships, their communication, and support their well-being. So I think this photo already gives a really nice sense of why art making can be positive for wee one's well-being. There's such a nice moment of connection between them here. And as Rachel's outlined, we want social and emotional development is happening within the context of their central relationships. We talk about secure attachments, and at its simplest, by that we mean that babies learn to trust that when they're distressed and they cry, the adults in their lives will respond most of the time and help them to feel better, and that in turn frees them up to feel safe to explore the world. But it's about more than just safety, so babies are born looking for communication and connection with their caregivers, in their interactions, they use all their available channels for communication. So there's sound, there's sight, there's movement. And it's where we see that really nice serve and return rhythm between baby and caregiver. And when we look at these conversations, they're amazingly well-timed and they're also mutually rewarding. So both the baby and the caregiver feel really good doing it. And art can be really amazing for developing these kinds of nice interactions. So in the DCA, we're taking a few different approaches to encouraging shared early art making. So for everybody to get involved, there's participative arts, which is about getting as many not to threes as possible, making art with their families. So we run things like messy creative sessions, using lots of process-based art making. We encourage parents to follow the wee ones lead, and we add into the drop-in activities that the DCA also offer. And then we do lots of outreach to community groups across the city. So we're particularly thinking about how we can get families who maybe have not visited the gallery before, or who don't feel it's for them, involved from a very early age. Where families are vulnerable and more support's needed, we have our art therapy groups. So those are small, closed groups of parents and infants, always run by a qualified art therapist, with families referred by health visitors, family nurses, and some voluntary groups, and where they're worried about their attachment relationships. So where parents might be struggling with their own mental health, there's therapeutic support there, which in turn will help them to be more emotionally available to their baby. We also help parents pick up on their baby's communications and response. So we're really gradually building those serve and return conversations that we know are important. And the art itself is quite a direct intervention and it really draws the parent and infant into interactions and encourages them to be playful together. So increasing that connectedness. During COVID restrictions, we've had to adapt a bit and we felt we really needed to act quickly to keep offering support for families who were struggling over that time, and maybe not getting their usual support. So we developed art boxes to send to families at home. These were focusing on encouraging shared art making with lots of baby safe materials, some information on ways you might use them and a bit of psychic education on why these might be beneficial and what they might see from their baby. We've sent out over 200 of these to families who were referred to us. And there's some nice examples of images that have been shared back with us by families using them. And we've now turned these ideas into more of a public project by developing the ideas into a book to get families started thinking about in Dundee's Festival of the Future. So some of the other nice images that I've been using in the background here were taken with families who came in to develop ideas with us and help co-create that book. In all these different approaches and with all those different levels of need, 
what we're looking to do is to build these really nice relational moments through the process of art making. So I'm going to hopefully, if the tech works, I want to show you a video now to illustrate this while I'm talking. It probably does a better job. So this comes from sessions that we ran with volunteer families rather than any who were referred to us for art therapy, but to show you a little bit about what we might do in the art therapy groups. Um, and there's no sound, so don't worry, you're missing it. So in this clip, you can really see that when babies and toddlers and their caregivers make art, it's drawing them together into those nice interactions. There's loads of eye contact. There are babies and adults sharing attention on the artwork. And there's pleasant physical contact as they try the sensory materials together. We're also looking to encourage parents to wonder about what their baby may be feeling and to help parents to see their infant's communications as meaningful. So art's really useful for that because of all those new textures and colours that we ones can explore. We see really clear reactions from them. So when they try paint for the first time, they might absolutely love it and get straight in there, or they might be a bit surprised or even dislike the texture, but there's usually quite a clear response. So there's lots for caregivers to notice and respond to, and we can encourage parents to be curious about their wee one's experience. You can see it's wee one here trying shaving foam for the first time. So we also see that when they use art materials to make marks, babies can see their own impact on the world, so in, in psychology, we might describe that as agency. So being able to see that they can make things happen. So that's really fundamental to wee one's sense of self. So it's nice to see it being so clearly demonstrated in art making. And when the caregiver responds positively, babies learn that their mark in the world is valued and their self-esteem is boosted. So another positive comes from caregivers noticing their wee ones making their mark or showing preferences for different materials or colors. All these things are about seeing the baby as an individual little person that they can relate to with their own personality and choices. So rather than seeing them as a kind of passive being to look after, it's about seeing them as a really active participant in the relationship. And that means that caregivers can relate to them and really enjoy their emerging personalities. We can also see babies getting to try these new sensory experiences. And because they're doing that in a safe space with their grown up and they're having a positive experience, they're learning that new experiences are a good thing, which sets them up for future learning. <laughs> Ending sessions in a bathtub. So I don't want to bombard you with the sort of data, but I did want to tell you a little bit about some of the changes that we've measured over the different activities. So we've been using a mixture of ways to gather evidence of change. Some of these were asking parents to fill in questionnaires and interviews. Um, and because we felt it was really important to capture the infant's experience, we've also been doing close observation from video footage to look at how their experience might be different in the last therapy session compared to the first. So the outcomes of the art therapy service showed the parents' own well-being had increased by the end of the art therapy group. And our video analysis shows that we also saw more of the behaviours which we know support attachments. So things like positive touch and shared attention that we've been looking at in the video. And then looking at the videos for the wee ones experiences, we saw more opportunities for them to experience their own agency. We saw them more engaged in the activity, showing more interest and pleasure. We saw more developmental opportunities and also more positive experiences of their relationship with their caregiver. And our results from the home art project are also really promising. So we spoke with parents who used the art materials at home with their young children, and they told us really encouraging things they'd noticed. So they talked about feeling better within themselves and also about being more involved in the play than usual. One parent gave a really nice example of how it was quieter than usual when they were using the art box because for this activity they turned off the TV. And several others spoke about being more down on the floor, joining in than they normally would do with toys. Parents also told us that they noticed their baby's behaviours, so things like them turning around to show them things or inviting them into the play. And that connects back again to that desire to communicate with their grown-ups and also to agency if they feel that they can direct their parent and get them to join in. Then they feel they have the ability to make change around them. Parents also described me one showing excitement when the art materials came out. And we can think of that as anticipation. So the babies were expecting to have fun with their parent when they're making art and expecting to enjoy time together. That really gets to just the heart of what attachment and well-being is. So we're really pleased with the results we've seen so far with those clinical outcomes, but also what we see and hear back ourselves anecdotally. So we ones enjoying playful time with their caregivers, families maybe finding support from others who've shared similar experiences and seeing the benefits themselves of doing art together. 
and perhaps also feeling more ownership of the gallery space. So with families who've come for art therapy or who we've met through outreach, then joining the public offering in the gallery, I think we find that the art gallery setting itself maybe holds less stigma than a mental health setting for this kind of work. And the art also acts as a bit of a hook for engaging families, particularly those from marginalized groups who maybe would find services less accessible. So for me, one of the most exciting things to observe is parents seeing their baby as a person in their own right with a really interesting personality to relate to. And that comes back to what I said during the video that the baby is an active participant. So making choices and expressing themselves. And that stance of seeing babies as an active participant has some really obvious relevance if we want to think more widely about the rights of infants and how do we give them a voice and how do we take their perspective into account. So we're just now, we're starting a new phase to scale up what we've been doing in Dundee across four different gallery sites in Scotland. And we're really hoping to see the same positive results and also learn a bit more about different local conditions that make the project successful and how we can meet specific local needs for families. So it's really exciting within our project, but it's also happening at a really good time in Scotland. I think where lots of development is going into perinatal and infant services. So I'm very pleased I'm gonna hand over now to Dr. Anne McFadden, who is the Infant Mental Health Lead for the Perinatal Mental Health Network. And she's the chair of the Scottish Government's Infant Mental Health Implementation and Advisory Group. You got that one out. Um, so she's really well placed to be able to give us a broad Scotland-wide perspective on those developments and our hopes for how we best support Scottish wee ones. So very pleased to pass over to Anne. Right, well, oh, there I am. That's great. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Vicky. It's really great to hear about your work and to see your work. It's just such a bonus to be able to look at those um, videos. And I noticed several comments on the um, on the chat that were really positive. And one was from a nursery teacher in Dundee who will be coming to see you sometime soon, I think. And as Rachel said, it's great to have the opportunity to be here at the RSE because it's all about you and um, your, the acknowledgement of your great work that's, that's got us here. Um, a little bit of repetition perhaps, um, but I don't think that will do any harm. As Rachel has said, in the first 1001 days from conception to age two, babies' brains and minds grow exponentially. Millions of neuronal connections are made in the context of special early relationships. Babies who are deprived of these intimate relationships have brains that look very different um, from those who've got an attachment to a primary caregiver. In the context of relationships, um, babies develop the capacity to experience, express and regulate emotions, to form close interpersonal relationships, have a positive sense of self, to explore the environment and learn, to adapt to their environment. Um, and all of this is really, really important. And when early relationships are misattuned or absent, babies are particularly vulnerable to abuse and neglect. The development, their development falls behind and they're also more likely to have problems later. We know that mental health in infancy is really, really important for later mental health. It also contributes um, to the capacity to um, be productive as an adult, to be satisfied with our lives, um, we learn, um, we don't learn, we, we acquire the ability to have empathy and self-regulation and the capacity to make and sustain relationships. So some of you will know that my next question um, is, is, is a favourite. We know this, we've got loads of scientific evidence now that has really built on people like Bowlby's early work about how good, how, how important good early relationships are. So we've got good scientific um, evidence. So why is it so hard for us to pay attention to babies and make sure that they get the best possible start? One theory might be this, is it because we've forgotten what it's like to be a baby? I won't remember anything about what's happening to me now, but it will affect me for the rest of my life. Okay. Is it because of um, stigma and a lack of understanding. So I want to just share some brief points from a study that was carried out by medical student Alicia, psychiatry trainees Fifi and Fanula, um, Professor Helen Minnis, Andrew Dawson and I. Professionals were asked about their views um, about infant mental health and on this page you can see a few quotes. Um, the first one, anytime I tell people what I'm doing they're like, Babies with mental health difficulties. 
you are kidding. So there's a bit of a challenge getting our head around the idea that babies, men, babies have a mental life. Um, I think the other thing belongs to us though. Um, you know, maybe we can't bear to think about babies suffering. As Rachel said, maybe we have mixed feelings towards them. Babies don't always arrive looking pretty. Many mothers and fathers, co-parents and birth partners feel very traumatized by the experience of labor and birth. Looking after babies is hard. Some cry a lot, some are inconsolable. Some of you will remember that when, you, when your babies were little, you had that feeling of desperation as you were trying to soothe them, trying to stop that incessant crying. We feel their distress in our own bodies and our minds. So maybe if we've got the choice, we choose not to think about it. Mostly, but not always, these um, negative feelings or these feelings of frustration and exasperation are tempered by intense feelings of love and a wish to protect. But maybe this is why, as a society, it's hard for us to prioritise the earliest months and years. We are trying, and as Vicky's work has um, shown us, um, things like um, attending to um, babies' agency, helping parents tune into their babies, thinking about the to and fro between babies and their carers is, is really, really important. And Art at the Start has done a wonderful job um, there and is a brilliant example of us doing that. So now to move on to the more boring part of my presentation, really. Um, in 2019, um, the Scottish Government committed to creating multi-agency models of infant mental health provision to meet the needs of families experiencing significant adversities, including infant developmental difficulties, parental substance use, domestic abuse and trauma. And we know that these things um, can make a difference to families. Um, really important to say that in the mix there um, and very much part of the perinatal mental health service development um, agenda is that when parents have depression or anxiety, psychotic illnesses, obsessional uh, compulsive disorder, eating disorders, it's a kind of one of those, you name it, um, then that impacts on the relationship with their infants too. Our vision in Scotland is that there's a shared understanding and definition of infant mental health and the importance of parent-infant relationships. We want that to span policy and practice and be um, part of the um, familiar concepts that are held by families and their communities. We want to support parents and carers to build positive relationships for their babies, um, with their babies, and we want to prevent later mental health and relationship problems. When concerns are identified, early intervention should be offered with universal care providers being able to access specialist services through clear care pathways so that babies and their families receive the right care at the right time, either from universal service providers or if necessary from specialist services. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But first I want to return to our first team. I'm grateful to many people who helped us um, work on the wellbeing for we one section of um, of the Parent Club website. This can be accessed by anyone and we're particularly keen that new parents look at the information provided here. So when we launched this a year ago, we had a brief spell of having adverts on the telly. And this is one of them. And now I've got my fingers crossed to hope that you can all see and hear this. You're not just having fun. You're not just making up stories. You're not just doing silly noises. You're doing much more than you think. You're helping your wee one feel happy and loved and boosting their social and emotional well-being now and in the future. Keep helping your baby's brain grow. Find out more at parentclub.scot slash wellbeing. So for those of you um, working in education, this could be a good resort, resource for PSE teaching. I've now lost my slides, not to worry. Um, 
I hope that thinking about babies' well-being and their relationships will become a core part of the curriculum. In some parts of the country, this is already happening. For example, in Dumfries and Galloway, um, a, a former colleague of mine, Lynn Cuddyhay, was delivering Solihull training um, to pupils in some local secondary schools. And there are other good examples too. Um, now I've got a challenge, everybody. So I'm just going to see if I can move the slides on. I'm going to stop sharing and start sharing again. Um, while I'm doing that, I just want to say what, what um, I'm going on to next is just to talk um, briefly about, um, about the systems that we're trying to set up um, in, in Scotland to do this. Um, let's just go down to here. Okay, the, the, what, what's important to us? What are our values? Um, and it's really important to think about this because as we want to go on and um, create services and systems, infant mental health systems across the country, we want to think about what's important. And one of the things that's really important for us um, to be thinking about is um, equality. Um, we've heard from Rachel um, and others that um, families who live in poverty or with um, insecure housing, um, they find it harder to access services um, and also are more likely to have, um, have pressures on them that, that make it um, that make it tricky to, to focus on parenting. We know that adversity in childhood is correlated with socioeconomic disadvantage in the first year, and we need to make sure that our services reach them. We need to evaluate our services, and we need to make sure that infants' rights are central and the principles of GERFEC and the promise are adhered to. We know that babies and carers were more adversely affected by the pandemic than others. And as we move into recovery from the pandemic, we need to ensure that those families are our priority in relation to services, but also their wider social situation. I'm apologize, I apologize now for not being able to um, move this back to a slideshow, but I'm not going to risk it. Um, so this slide shows many of the services who will be part of infant mental health systems including, of course, the baby and the carer at the centre. And you can see here that they're surrounded by universal services. Health visitors, midwives and family nurses are a really important um, first port of call for families. Um, on this diagram, we can see um, around the circle the services that the Scottish Government has funded. And we have specialist interventions on offer in specialist infant mental health teams, perinatal mental health teams, in hospital maternity and neonatal teams, and third sector. And I want to just take a moment to pause on third sector because third sector services offer an invaluable support to many, many families. Um, they do things like um, help them with the practicalities, scaffolding them, um, making sure that they get to services if they need them. And they are also have um, specialist practitioners working within some of them who offer um, really informed and specialist interventions for families to improve um, babies' well-being. The other, the other teams and sets of people on this diagram are all really, really important too. We've got people working in adult mental health, addictions, learning disability. We're doing a big project just now trying to improve services for um, women who substance use and their families. We need to be linked up with acute and community paediatrics, with neurodevelopmental services, and of course with social work and with early years and education services. Early relationships between babies and their parents are crucial for the building of healthy brains and minds. And I'm just going to finish um, with my favourite quote from my favourite film, which is The Angel's Share. And this, um, this is Leone summing up really the point of this whole afternoon. Leone and Robbie are living in not great circumstances and Robbie is to all intents and purposes um, a young offender. They have a little baby. 
So the midwife said to me that only half its brains developed and the next half depends on us. You only get one shot at being a wee baby. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for three fantastic presentations, folks. Uh, that last quotation is really quite, well, you know, I'm a bit of a solid sort of fellow, but I felt slightly tearful, you know? Uh, so uh, uh, there, there you go. Thank you for sharing that. So you get one go at it. Um, well, there are some questions. We have 10 minutes or so for some questions. Uh, and I see the Q&A has been going strong. Um, we've had quite a lot of folk have uh, already had their answers because uh, my colleagues have been typing away here. But there was one right at the end, which I'll pick up, and then we'll sort of work my way back. Um, Susie Dick asks, what's the plan to enable equal access to resources for those in remote rural areas, islands, etc.? cetera, is the aim to target those in urban areas first? So maybe um, that's, well, I don't know who'd like to answer that one. Um, is there always an urban priority or is there going to be the more uh, uh, out and about? Well, one of the things that's happened um, with the rollout of infant mental health services is we um, at the government in its ultimate wisdom decided to do this in a waived way. So we started with um, a service in Fife and a service in Lanarkshire, both of which are most are mixed rural and urban. And then in our next wave, um, we had two um, city sites and NHS Highland. Um, and Rachel in her role as the Parent Infant Foundation um, supporter of, of all activities to do with infant mental health in Scotland, um, lent a specific hand to Highland and Lothian um, to build their services. Mm -hmm. The progress is variable across the country, but we are regular, I regularly meet with people in Shetland, Orkney, Highland, mm -hmm. Dumfries and Galloway, Ayrshire, I mean, all, all, all of the boards um, across, mm -hmm. across the country, and they're all at varying stages of it. And it's mm -hmm. not the case by any manner of means that the urban um, areas are cracking on with it any better than the the, the rural ones. Um, so mm -hmm. it really is a concern to us. And I think we have to be very innovative about the models of how we deliver this in um, areas that have got a large geographical area with a small population. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, there's a pick up on this, I think, by, some, by Deborah Dawkins. Do you think Dawkins. that was the size? Have we got a follow up on that? Let's have a look. It's great news. Here's someone who said, love to be involved, goes ahead Edinburgh, but there's a little something there. And Susie Dix says, thanks for answering. Um, I was going to uh, say on the remote one that um, from our point of view, we're just uh, on our rollout, one of the places is going to be used where we work, have a really like amazing art therapist on US yeah. that will be in a gallery there. So I think almost yeah. as remote as we can get. So we're trying to do a mixture. Yeah, I did notice there's something here from Deborah Dawkins who asked about uh, who's taking charge of the of, um, art, art therapy thing uh, in Sutherland for Home Start East Highland. So uh, that, that's a little connection there. Um, more stuff is coming in. Um, uh, here we go. Um, anonymous attendee says, is it anywhere else our families can get support other than CAMS in relation to mental health? Which, um, hmm. That's a well, question, I, isn't it? I, I must come in there, I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah. Infant mental health is really, really um, important in, in terms of thinking about further upstream and, and actually the things that we can do if we attend to infants' mental health mm -hmm. actually may help um, the incredible demand that we have for CAM services at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and infant mental health services by and large in Scotland are not part of CAM services, so mm -hmm. shouldn't be affected by the incredible waiting lists. And, and, mm -hmm. and you will all understand that waiting lists are an impossible concept for infants, because if you're on a six month waiting list, more than half your life is gone. So, mm -hmm. so really we, we need to make sure that we are attending to infants' um, um, needs promptly. And um, really, as I say, um, trying to do a lot of preventative work that will stop children needing CAMS later on. Mm. Yeah, there was a good point, I think, um, in one of the earliest chats from, who was it now? Um, uh, it was uh, Graham Shulman um, who addressed Rachel, I think, and you got back about that, didn't you, Rachel? Would you like to add something to that or maybe go over it again? Yeah, I mean, Graham makes a really good point, which is that we talk a lot about what the implications for adulthood are of difficulties in relationships and emotional well-being in babies when they're babies 
and we quite easily get sidetracked into thinking what the what the implications are further down the track and Graham makes the very important point that of course the pathology and the very grave difficulties and the risk can be there at the time for babies and my response to him was to absolutely agree and it's one of the reasons why we have to, it has to be a multi-systems process to look after we ones in Scotland now we have to be thinking you know we talk about upstream spending or upstream resources and we we're, we're talking often about the life course mm. but there's a sort of upstream of infancy also um and thinking about how we give enough resources and we sp we spread very thin resources across preventative services mm. and the extremely difficult, risky professions, uh, 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 interventions, which um, do dyadic work with caregivers and their infants. It's really, it's really difficult. Um, and one that we're constantly grappling with, I think. Um, mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thanks very much for that. Um, Sarah Armitage asked a question, and I'm afraid I'm, I'm using some ignorance here because I'm, I'm not quite sure what ELC stands for off the top of my head. Um, are you concerned about the impact of the ELC expansion, I presume, on the relationships between young children and their primary carer? What's 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 some ELC people? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm afraid uh, early, uh, early uh, learning something. Yeah, yes, it is. I, I think on one hand, the concern is that there's some notion out there that increasing the number of hours that babies are entitled, you know, oh. infants are entitled to in early learning um, centres. Um, is a good thing but actually there's some concern that actually we're taking them further away from their parents and I would like to see that develop and we have been discussing it in various groups into mm -hmm. something that became more like a family centre. Early learning centres should be able to support um, infants and their parents to um, to get to know each other better and some of them are doing a really good job of that. Mm -hmm. So, so really important just to say more hours at nursery is not the answer so mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Sorry about that. Is that's since my time as dad. So uh, 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 moving that on, just about parading, parading my antiquity there. Uh, thanks for that. Um, there's a whole lot of questions here about art classes and areas. People seem terribly keen on that. I think your presentation, Vicky, um, got people carried away. Um, uh, great for my families in the under threes. And here's somebody who says, I recommend the Color Monster book. Uh, do people know of the Color Monster book? Is this no? It's been a great resource for us to encourage our ones in nursery to identify and express emotions. Uh, so, uh, uh, if there are monsters out there in colour, then that's that's jolly good. Um, here's um, oh, I'm getting a few more now. Um, services available for babies with visual impairment. Here's an interesting one. Uh, anyone got any views on that? Any our speakers know about this? Well, no, but nobody should be excluded. Um, and mm. I think the question is is do they require specialist services and i know um when i was training which is a very long time ago um there were some child psychotherapists who specifically were looking at babies with visual impairments and mm. um, i think it would require um some thought about that but but no infant mental health service should be excluding a child mm. because mm. they've got um, a visual impairment and mm. there was another question there which i thought was really interesting which was about should should the investment be in universal or specialist services mm. and i think the answer is actually we need to build systems that include these and make sure that we've got good pathways and good communication between them mm -hmm. yeah very good very good i was going to say on the uh, question of um around your visual impairment is that we've um worked with the ones in the art therapy group and that I think that can be a really useful way to communicate you think of the kind of sensory ways that you're communicating as well it doesn't have to be kind of visual art it's a full body experience for we ones there's that like yeah all those kind of textures mm. and different ways to communicate um, mm. so that, that could be really useful if that was something they were thinking mm. about yeah there was some good goings with plasticine there uh so that's uh good stuff um the color monster does seem to be all over the place um uh, we've had several color monsters here um and all the time give, do, is it, do, do any of you people know this I, I, color monster again is since my time uh, it's obviously quite a big thing um and people have asked questions one or two obvious ones here about um uh, people may have joined later to say um is all this going to be up and about um uh, on the um, 
uh, YouTube. Uh, it's going to be on the RSE YouTube channel, isn't it, um, Kate? So um, yes, we'll have all that. And also, people have asked uh, about links and things, um, and we can send them out later on um, uh, after to the, to attendees. Um, that can we do that? Um, yes, RSE is uh, going to send them round to everybody afterwards. So that's very good. Um, what, here's someone who says, I work in uh, ELC, which I now know what it means, and freedom to come a constant response. We can't support until a child turns three from outside. So is this something others are finding too? Is this something that fits in for some of the questions of equality you were raising? Well, it fits into the idea that people don't understand that um, mm. infants can have mental health needs in their own right. And I think mm. there's a bit of a there's a bit of a stigma attached to to mm. babies and I'm very sad to hear that that's the message that um, um, that, that people are getting that services don't exist um, under three because this is exactly what we're trying to do is create mm. um, services and systems from conception to the mm. third birthday is is that area but of course we're also thinking about making sure that um, babies don't then fall off a cliff that we're connected mm. up to three to mm. five services to later later on services so we need to be we need to be very careful that we don't um prejudice against mm. um mm -hmm. children because of their age in mm. the same way that in our society it's now accepted that we shouldn't prejudice against older people because of their age mm. we, mm -hmm. we mustn't prejudice against babies yeah especially well rachel's um presentation was very strong on telling us all of those neurons to sort of zoom around that early period isn't it um going back into conception here's a question from erica childress is there any concern about stress in the mother during the pregnancy phase um how that's built in enormous concern mm, i um, guess you know it's 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 the point often of crossover between what I mean, the, we call perinatal mental health services perinatal mental health services. But what we mean, like Anne was explaining, was the mental health of the, the mother in the perinatal period. It, it doesn't mean, that in, you know, everything. Otherwise, infant mental health would come under that. But yeah. yes, absolutely. And if we're talking about creating conditions where people can have the best hope of yeah. avoiding having yeah. to be in a specialist service with, with their baby, then... We're talking about helping people process trauma, have a, have a decent standard of life, have access to education and community and support. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, none of these things necessarily mean anything. Stress mm -hmm. in the perinatal period doesn't mean you'll be a bad parent, of course. But it, the more obstacles you have in front of you, the more you, you know, more strength you have to muster to get through mm -hmm. it all. And we want people to not have to struggle mm -hmm. in the way yeah. that they have done. Yeah, I noticed that uh, Gail Longmere here is talking about um, bereavement during the period, um, and um, uh, that's something I know is, a, is 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 well, maybe that's something that a lot of us would think about. Yeah, uh, I think that's my, maybe one thing that neither myself nor Anne mentioned, which is along the peri alongside the perinatal and infant mental health developments, there are uh, services being funded across this the country for psychology in maternity and neonatal. Um, mm -hmm services and they all need to speak to each other of course they're slightly separate specialities mm -hmm. but then at the, the national bereavement care pathway for um, perinatal loss for lots of different reasons um, mm -hmm. absolutely people need access to those things too what's important is that those of us who are creating those services create services mm -hmm. where people don't feel it very very brutal to go between one and the other you know where mm -hmm. that's a seamless experience for families mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Alison Walker responded with a, a little email here, this thing here, videos about development of the mother's mental health. Uh, Anne, sorry. No, I was just going to say, um, you know, that the loss of a baby can impact on the next pregnancy. Um, mm. You know, loss of someone close to you during pregnancy, obviously, um, you know, grief affects people in different ways. So I think it is really important to be sensitive to individuals' mm. needs in that period of, of pregnancy and the postnatal period mm. to think mm. about to think about how be, how best to support them and again i mean i know i said earlier and it sounded rather glib that there's no right way to do this but actually mm. what's really important is the relationship between um the professional who's who's helping the family and the family and what that then brings forward mm. in terms of understanding um their mm. difficulties because they're unique to them Mm, yeah, I think one or two of the questions here have been coming in about uh, which place the the, ba the baby within the context of the larger group. Um, you're answering, I see one, Rachel. What is important to think about, Ray? 
infant mental health will become a big brother or sister, um, which is um, uh, an interesting one here. Um, I'm conscious that we are actually coming towards the end of our time uh, uh, because it's, um, well, in fact, we've, we've gone over it, uh, uh, which, is, which, is, which is terrible. Uh, and everyone's wanting off to want their tea. Um, but um, I'd like to sort of finish off by saying how much I've appreciated listening to this event. I think it's been fantastic. And I'd like to um, thank our speakers, um, uh, Rachel and, and Anne and, and Vicky, for, for, for giving us a, a fantastic um, set of, of, of talking points and discussion points. I can see from the chat that a lot of folk uh, are terribly keen to hear more. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I should flag up that the event is being recorded, as I said at the very beginning, and then we're going to be putting it up on the RSC um, YouTube channel, so you can uh, watch it at your leisure, uh, watch it at your leisure. Um, but also, um, uh, the um, links and things um, we're going to be sending out to, um, uh, as been mentioned, we're going to send out to the uh, participants after, after this event. Um, so, um, I, I, it's hard to do this. Really, what I do now is have a round of applause. Uh, there are, there are, get it, they were at one point getting on for 300 participants, but I think people are beginning to head off for their tea. Uh, so I'm going to simply um, be a kind of proxy uh, applauder. Uh, so I'm going to go clap, clap, clap like that. Uh, and and uh, maybe my speakers could imagine uh, that everybody else is clapping uh, 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 using, using the, the marvels of modern. Uh, imagination uh, and, and we'll thank you well. so much too <laughs> thank you so much it's been a really lovely event uh, and i look forward to hearing much more all about it thank you thank, thank you. you jeremy thank you vicky it's thank a pleasure you. well done all of you super job super thank job you. bye 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 bye